Today we will talk about plate tectonics, topic number five. So the Earth's lithosphere is broken up into rigid pieces called tectonic plates, which contain both continental and oceanic crust. And you could see you have different plates labeled, like the African plate, the South American plate, the North American plate, the Pacific plate, and then you have some smaller ones like the Philippine plate, the Cocos plate, this little one, the Juan de Fuca plate, Caribbean plate. And where the plates meet each other is called a plate boundary. And you have a symbol on the bottom that's like these little tiny triangles sticking out of the red line. And that indicates a convergent boundary where two plates are bumping into each other. And then you have this solid dark red line with no symbols sticking off of it. And that represents a divergent boundary. And that's where plates are moving away from each other. And then you have this lighter colored sort of orange color. That's your transform boundary. And that's where plates are moving next to each other but in two different directions, in opposite directions. So the theory of plate tectonics explains the mobility of the Earth's crust. And we could see evidence that the continents have moved around over time. The development of continental features, for example, mountain ranges, and the development of features in ocean basins such as trenches and island arcs. And we're gonna spend some time going over all of these different concepts and features. So some early ideas about crustal movement include that before the theory of plate tectonics existed as a theory, there was a hypothesis called continental drift and that explained some aspects of continental movement around the Earth. So here's some early ideas. You have this guy, Alfred Wegener, although it might be pronounced Wegener, actually, in the late 19th century, found that there were similarities on different continents that are far apart from each other. For example, fossils on one continent were found to match Con um, fossils on continents that were far apart. Also, you have similarities in the rocks in mountain ranges on two different continents that are not near each other. For example, the Appalachian Mountains in the United States are similar in age and similar in rock type as the Caledonian mountain chain in Europe. And when they talk about similar mountain type, uh, rock type, that includes looking at metamorphic index minerals, which we talked about in the last lecture. So you may have the same index minerals indicating that the rocks formed under similar metamorphic conditions. So here is an example of the fossil evidence that supports continental drift. So if we look at these different animals, and here's a plant. So you have the Glossopterus, which lived in all of the southern continents. And that symbol is a little green circle, a light green. So you have a few continents that have the Glossopterus fossil that was found, but those continents today are pretty far away from each other. So like South America has that fossil, but then also so does South Africa. And a little bit further northward in Eastern Africa. India, Antarctica, and Australia also have that same fossil. 
Then you have a Mesosaurus, which is shown as this pink circle. And you find that along the, the uh, southern area of Africa. You also find it in the southern area of South America, which are two pieces of land that are far apart today. Then you have these Sinonathus, which is a little blue circle. And you also find that fossil in Africa and South America, which again are two pieces of land that are far apart from each other, across from the Atlantic Ocean from each other. And then you have this fossil, the Lystrosaurus, which you find as this darker pink color. And you find that in Africa, India, and Antarctica, which again are continents that are far apart from each other today. So if continents with matching fossils are rearranged to be next to one another, the fossil locations make more sense than just inferring that perhaps plants and animals somehow got across the oceans to other continents. Okay, so like if you use South America and Africa as an example, you have quite a few fossils that match and that are present in both of these continents. So instead of thinking that all these plants and animals somehow traveled across the Atlantic Ocean to get from one of these locations to the other, it actually makes more sense if we make a map and put those continents touching each other, it actually makes more sense that the land actually used to just be next to each other in, in, a, in this type of orientation. So that is how fossil evidence supports that the continents used to be in a different orientation, a different location than they are today. And the continental drift aspect is that the continents used to be in a different location and they have moved over time into new locations. So then we can look at the similarity in the rocks in mountains. So the mountain belts labeled here are of the same age and rock types. For example, the same index minerals that show similar temperature and pressure conditions during metamorphism. So this on the left is what we have today as our after picture. This is today. So you have the Appalachian Mountains and the Caledonian Mountains. And then the mountains go across Scandinavia and British Isles. The Appalachian Mountains go across the eastern coast of North America, the northern part of North America. Okay, and these are similar rocks, similar mountains, but they're far apart from each other across the Atlantic Ocean. But if we put all the continents that contain these rocks together, it actually makes more sense that it used to all be one continuous mountain range. And that perhaps the mount the mountain range was split apart when these continents split apart from each other. So it makes more sense when you think that the continents used to be all connected. And then here is a diagram from your textbook showing the mountains located the way they were when they formed and when these pieces of land were all connected. So Alfred Wagner noted that South America's eastern coastline seems to fit together with Africa's western coast, sort of like a puzzle piece. You see that? So that was further evidence that perhaps the continents used to be in a different location and they have since moved 
to new locations. And it fits pretty nicely like a puzzle piece. So Wegener hypothesized that all the continents were part of a supercontinent called Pangaea about 20, I'm sorry, about 200 million years ago, and later drifted apart to form the continents that we see today. So this is the Pangaea map from his 1915 publication. And this is a modern reconstruction of Pangaea based on his map. Now also note, this is the equator today, right? And you could see that there are some continents that are in other orientations than they are today. Like India, for example, is completely south of the equator in this map. So then we can get into the conversation about what causes continental drift. What is that driving mechanism for the continents moving around the Earth? So now that there was enough evidence that continents have moved around the Earth, scientists tried to figure out what was causing that, what was causing the movement. And that led us to the discovery of seafloor spreading. So before World War II, we knew little about the seafloor. Sonar allowed for rapid seafloor mapping and seafloor maps created by ships. Whoops. as the ships crossed the oceans by emitting sound waves to the seafloor. And if you know the speed of sound in water, you just need to know how long it takes for the sound waves to hit the seafloor and then bounce back to the ship. And then there's a formula that you could use that incorporates the speed of sound in water and then you could figure out how deep the seafloor or how deep the ocean is in that location, like how long it takes for that sound to hit the seafloor and come back. So that's how you use sonar to figure out how deep the ocean is in different locations. And then the ship just needs to go around different parts of the ocean and emit this, the sound waves to the seafloor in different spots. And that creates a seafloor map, which we called a bathymetry map. Bathymetry is the, is, is a, it shows you the depth of the ocean. So today they're able to use bathymetry, they're able to use satellite imagery and satellite data to determine bathymetry. Okay, so again, how do you use sonar to measure water depth? You know the speed of sound in water. You measure how long it takes for a sound to hit the seafloor and reflect back to the ship. And then you could calculate how far the sound waves traveled based on how long it took for the waves to travel in the water. So navies during World War II needed detailed information about the seafloor. So that is one way that we got a lot of our seafloor information. It was because of oceanography during World War II requiring seafloor information. Also, if, the, if, if everyone's using submarines, you're gonna need to know how to navigate the seafloor. So oceanographers discovered that the, there was a mid-ocean 
mountain range or a mid-ocean ridge that runs through every ocean. It's not in continuous lines, but rather it's little segments that are offset by fractures and transform faults. So you look at this diagram to the right and it shows you a snippet of a mid-ocean ridge. And it's not just a straight or a curved line, it's little segments. And then here's like this little section blown up larger. You can see it's little segments of mountain ranges and then it's offset by cracks in the crust. And then you have another segment continuing here. Then you have another fracture and then an another segment here. So that's how the mid-ocean ridge looks. And you have that in every ocean. And then this is the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic Ocean. You can see, again, it's offset by all these fractures and it's little segments. So if you go from X to X prime here, this red line is represented down here. So there's X and X prime. And it shows you, here's the coast, then it dips down into the deep ocean called the abyssal plain. And then on the other side, you have the same thing. And then in the very center, you have the mid-ocean ridge where it gets higher up. The seafloor goes higher. It's a higher elevation. And that's your mountain range. And then in the very center of that mountain range, you have volcanic activity. Oceanographers also discover deep ocean trenches, which are narrow sections of very deep ocean. And they were discovered near volcanic island arcs, which we'll discuss later. And this is a world map of the bathymetry of the seafloor. And you can zoom in, or you can go to the original website and look more closely at that. It may have better resolution if you do it that way. But here you can see the mid-ocean ridge in the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. And the dark blue is deeper water and then the light blue is more shallow. And then you can also see like the coastlines. So the west coast the east coast of North America, you have the, the, the continental shelf is pretty shallow and it sticks out quite a bit into the ocean. So this is all ocean water, but it's relatively shallow. And you can see that in other locations as well, a shallow continental shelf. So here are some other seafloor discoveries. Further studies showed that much of the seafloor is covered in a thin layer of fine grained sediment and tiny shells of dead plankton. Studies also showed that sediment layers were thicker the further away you get from the mid ocean ridge. So all the way on the left of this little picture here, this is the mid ocean ridge with the magma rising up into that center of the ridge. And then here's the ocean crust is this gray line. And your sediment layers are these little lines in here. And you can see as you go away from the mid-Atlantic ridge or the mid-ocean ridge, the sediment layers get thicker and thicker. So that suggests that the rock, the ocean floor basalt or the ocean crust is brand new over here because it does not have a lot of sediment deposited on it yet. But that the ocean crust all the way out here is older as it has a lot more sediment layers that have been deposited on it. 
studies also showed that the ocean crust is mainly made of basalt, which is a different composition than continental crust, which is granite, which is a felsic rock, felsic composition. Studies also showed that more heat rises at the mid-ocean ridges than the rest of the ocean crust. That's what led to speculation that magma may be rising at the mid-ocean ridges. And then here is another diagram showing you the mid-ocean ridge and then the thickness of the sediments increase as you go away from that mid-ocean ridge. So out here, the, set, the ocean crust is older. It has more sediment layers on it because it's older. It had more time to accumulate sediments on top of it. Whereas as you are closer to the mid-ocean ridge, it's brand new rocks. It did not have a lot of time to accumulate sediments on top of it yet. So the sediment layers are thinner. And another seafloor discovery is that when you map out the distribution of earthquakes around the world, you see earthquake locations are not random. So when you look at this map, you see all these red dots. Now, how would you describe the orientation of these red dots? I mean, do you see the sections of the ocean floor or the sections of the ocean on the map where there are no red dots? Okay, this whole section down here has no red dots. There are no red dots over here. No red dots over here. None up here, none over here. But then you have this line in the middle of the ocean here where most of the earthquakes are concentrated on this line right here. So this was a major discovery that earthquakes occur in specific locations, like these long belts, rather than just randomly oriented around the earth. This is a 1953 map of earthquakes that have occurred in the ocean. And then here is a similar thing, but it's a different map. So maps that show the distribution of earthquakes suggest that earthquake locations are not random. Okay. So you can see there's whole sections of the ocean where there's no earthquakes occurring. Now, what do you see when you put a map of the tectonic boundaries next to the earthquake map. What do you see? Does anyone want to say what they see? Yes, exactly. The two maps match. The earthquake map matches the tectonic plates map specifically where the boundaries are between the plates. Okay, good. Thank you. So again, it's not random where the earthquakes occur. It matches up with the plate boundaries. So then we have someone named Harry Hess. And he proposed that the ocean floor varies in age across the ocean and that basalt rock at the mid-ocean ridges must be younger than ocean crust further from the ridge because the sediment layers thickened away from the ridge, which I showed you a minute ago. He also proposed that high heat flow and earthquakes at the mid-ocean ridges was showing that the crust was breaking apart at the ridges and that magma is rising there and forming new ocean crust. And the magma rises at the mid-ocean ridge 
because of decompression melting. And we discussed that in the igneous chapter. So where you have the two plates moving away from each other, it creates less it creates a situation where there is less pressure on the mantle. And then you have some partial melting of the rocks. So here you can see the mid ocean ridge and then you have the sediment layers getting thicker as you go away from the mid ocean ridge. And then that shows us that the basalt, as you go away from the mid-ocean ridge, gets older. Now, in this case, this is a ship that drilled into the sediment and got sediment cores, we call them. And then you're able to see, that's how they were able to see the thickness of the sediment layers. They retrieved cores. It's similar to if you had a layer cake and then if you were to stick like um, a tube into the layer cake and then you pull the tube out, it would look similar to these cores at the top where you would get like little bits of the different layers of the cake within the tube. So that's how they get sediment cores. They drill down and you're basically just it's the same concept as sticking a tube into a layer cake, in other words. And they're also able to capture some of the basalt at the bottom of the sediment layers. So we also have that information. We have the actual sediments. And that's how you're able to see the thickness of the sediment layers. And this shows you the age of the lithosphere of the ocean and the younger rocks are in the red and orange colors and the older rocks are the purple and the blues so you can see here's purple in here the mid-ocean ridges are all younger rocks as you go away from the mid-ocean ridges, the rocks get older in either direction from the mid-ocean ridge. You look at most of the ridges, you could see a progression from younger to older rocks in either direction. So if ocean crust was created at the mid-ocean ridges, it must be destroyed elsewhere. You can't just keep creating ocean crust and never destroy any other rocks there, because the earth is a finite size. So you can't just like indefinitely create ocean crust. So on the other side of the mid-ocean ridges, on the other end of the ocean crust, you have what's called deep trenches. And that's where old oceanic crust sinks back into the mantle. And that is called a subduction zone. Okay, so here you have the mid-ocean ridge on the right of the diagram. It's forming basalt, okay? And then here it's going on the other side, not pictured. And then here you have an older piece of ocean crust. And then to the left, you would have another mid-ocean ridge somewhere to the, all the way to the left would be another mid-ocean ridge. So now this ocean crust is sinking beneath this continental crust here. That's the subduction, okay? And subduction happens when two plates collide with each other. When you have a collision between continental crust and ocean crust, the ocean crust is what's going to sink into the mantle. 
That's because continental crust is very buoyant. It behaves similar to a piece of styrofoam in a swimming pool. You can't really sink styrofoam into water. Okay, so continental crust will stay afloat on top of the mantle, but ocean crust is pretty dense and heavy, so it's able to sink into the mantle at these collisions. This type of collision is called a convergent boundary. That's where two plates collide into each other. And the mid-ocean ridge, you have two plates moving away from each other. So we call that a divergent plate boundary or a sea floor spreading center, or you can call it a spreading center. So here where the ocean crust is sinking back into the mantle at the subduction zone, it is going to ultimately melt and be destroyed. While on this side, you're creating new basalt rocks, new ocean crust is forming here. And then this little V shape right here, this V shape is a trench. And that's going to be very deep ocean water. So seafloor spreading. At the mid-ocean ridges, tectonic plates move away from each other, which makes space for magma to rise to the surface and form new mafic rocks, for example, basalt. This is how the seafloor spreads and grows. Seafloor spreading was the answer to the question of what is the driving force that causes the continents to move around the Earth? Okay, and you'll see that as a question in the review sheet. It's asking what is the driving force that was discovered at some point? What was the driving force of the plates moving around? And part of that answer is seafloor spreading. Let me see, look here, the question is, why was the discovery of seafloor spreading important for the development of the theory of plate tectonics? Okay, so it's all about the seafloor spreading, explaining the mechanism of why the plates are moving around the earth and how they're moving around. And then here is a cross section of the ocean crust at the mid ocean ridges. So you have, you have lower down, you have the mantle and the asthenosphere, and then you have the cracks at the mid-ocean ridge, which causes partial melting because you're putting less pressure on the rocks below here. So you have decompression melting. So it rises up and it erupts at the mid-ocean ridge axis and it forms pillow basalt. So you get a lot of basalt um, that is in the shape of pillow basalt. And then you have all these dikes that are going vertically upward to form those pillow basalts at the surface. And then down here, we call it gabbro because it's mafic, but it's intrusive. So now it's no longer the idea of continental drift. It's now the theory of plate tectonics in the story timeline that I'm telling you. So the old idea was continental drift and that idea was that continents were separate pieces from ocean crust and that the continents drifted by plowing through the oceans. The new theory was the theory of plate tectonics. And that's 
new ocean crust being created at mid-ocean ridges or the spreading centers and crust is destroyed at subduction zones where there are trenches. And that's where ocean crust sinks back into the mantle. Also, we now know that continental crust can be on the same plate as ocean crust. For example, the North American plate contains continental and oceanic crust. So when we look at the North American plate, there's continent and there's ocean. So within one plate, you can have both continental crust and oceanic crust. While that was not really understood when we still had the hypothesis of continental drift. So here is a more recent hypothesis and um, it's called what mech it's called the ridge push and slab pull and it really discusses what mechanisms drive plate movement. So you have something called gravity driven ridge push and that is at the axis of the mid ocean ridge the ocean crust is a higher elevation a little bit compared to the rest of the ocean crust. And that is because the hot magma and the hot new basalt is rising a little bit higher in the mantle because it's more buoyant. Whereas the older ocean crust is colder and it's denser. So because it's denser, it sinks into the mantle a little bit more. So that creates this higher elevation at the mid-ocean ridge compared to the rest of the ocean crust. So then gravity is able to push the ocean crust down the slope away from the mid-ocean ridge. And it pushes it towards the subduction zone on the other side of the ocean crust. Now keep in mind, all of this gray is all ocean crust. So here it's sinking down and here's another piece of ocean crust here. Okay, so that's ridge push. Slab pull is when this edge of the ocean crust that's older and colder and denser is subducting, it pulls the rest of the plate downward with it. So like the rock behind this, the ocean crust behind this area is getting pulled downward into the mantle led by this piece, okay? So it's like the whole piece is being pulled downward. So that's your slab pull. So the ridge push and the slab pull together is really what's mainly driving the plate movement around the earth. So here you have an example. Here's the Mariana Trench. That's the deepest trench on earth. The deepest part of the ocean is the Mariana Trench. And this is what a trench looks like. So here's our mid-ocean ridge and here's another, here, here's a mid-ocean ridge and then here's the ocean crust. And here it's subducting beneath another piece of ocean crust. And then it's pulling the rest of the slab of ocean crust downward with it. And then here, the high elevation is causing this to fall or slide down slope due to gravity. And then part of this ocean crust starts to melt and then it forms a line of volcanoes above this melted area in the subduction zone. So then you have these little volcanoes that form there.
Okay, so I'm just going to pause the recording and show you a video clip from this video called How the Earth Was Made, the Deepest Part of the Earth. So this shows you the driving mechanisms that I just discussed, the ridge push and the slab pull. Now convection in the asthenosphere speeds up or slows down the motion. But generally the plate motions are driven by ridge push and slab pull and then sped up or slowed down by convection. So convection looks like this. It's a type of heat transfer. And in this case, it's a pot of boiling water. So you're heating up the water at the bottom of the pot because that's where your heat source is. And then hot water rises because it's less dense so it starts to rise up. And then when the water reaches the top of the pot, it gets cooler because it's further from the heat source. And then cooler water is more dense, so that sinks. So it creates this circulatory motion of warm water and, and cold water. And it's based on density and moving away from the heat source or moving towards the heat source. So in the mantle or in the asthenosphere, you're not gonna have as fluid of convection as you see here in a pot of boiling water, but you are gonna have convection. It's just not gonna look like a very fluid, flowy material but you do actually have convection. And this shows you a timeline from when we had Pangaea 200 million years ago. That's the late Triassic period. And then you started to really break up Pangaea. Um, in this case, this picture shows you 150 million years ago. The first major event during the breakup of Pangaea was the separation of North America and Africa, which marked the opening of the North Atlantic Ocean. So you see South America and Africa are still connected, but North America and Africa are starting to separate. Whereas in, during Pangaea, they were connected. Now this breakup between North America and Africa left evidence behind. And the evidence that was left behind, we see in parts of New Jersey, for example. And we're gonna talk about that later in this lecture, but we have a lot of evidence of volcanism. There's basalt in many areas of New Jersey and that volcanism, that rock, tells us that there was a breakup of two continental pieces and there was rifting. Rifting means moving away from, so like the two pieces of land moving away from each other is rifting. So we'll see the evidence for that later in the lecture. Okay, and this is 90 million years ago. The earth is starting to look a little bit more like it does today, and then 50 million years ago, 20 million years ago, and then your present day. So then we're going to get into the different types of plate boundaries and discuss the different aspects of each. So here you have the mid-ocean ridge, that's your divergent plate boundary. And then you have subduction, where you have a convergent plate boundary. And then here is your trench. 
see this, even though it doesn't look that deep in this diagram, that ends up being really deep ocean water. Okay, and then as the subduction happens, you have melting, and then that melted molten rock is going to rise up and form volcanic islands. And that's what's called a volcanic arc. And then there's another plate boundary called transform. And you can see here you have this piece of land is moving towards us. And this piece of land is moving away from us. And that's a transform boundary. Movement in opposite directions next to each other. Okay, and then this is a similar diagram. It just shows you um, here's an ocean hot spot, which would be like Hawaii. And then it shows you here a mountain range forming, which is a different type of convergence than these pieces of ocean crust with the subduction. This is a different type of convergence where you have two pieces of continental crust colliding and it forms a mountain range. And then here, back here, you have another type of, con of divergence. Instead of like the mid-ocean ridge, whoops, sorry. Instead of the mid-ocean ridge, you have two pieces of land, like two pieces of continental land moving away from each other, rather than two pieces of ocean crust moving away from each other. And we're going to talk about all of these different types of plate movement the rest of the lecture. So again, here is a map of the different tectonic plates. There are seven major plates. And then there are many smaller ones. And again, plates can contain both continental and oceanic crust. And plates move at a rate of about 1 to 15 centimeters per year. Now, I've heard that that's a similar rate to the growth of your fingernails. And when you look more closely, you have different symbols. So you have the arrows moving opposite directions, but next to each other, that's your transform plate boundary, where the arrows are moving away from each other, that's your divergence. And then when the arrows are moving towards each other, it's convergence. And then these little boxes are indicating the direction of the subduction. So the overriding plate means the plate that's on top of the one that's subducting into the mantle. And then we have our three different types of plate boundaries. Divergent, again, moving away from each other. Convergent is moving towards each other and transform is next to each other, but opposite direction. And again, the term plate boundary is the region where tectonic plates meet. So I am going to end here. We'll pick up with divergent boundaries next time.